Jane Austen's works are not usually considered to be historical novels, and there are readers who believe that they tell timeless, that is to say, atemporal tales. In fact, they are full of references, more or less evident ones, to the social, political and economic conditions of her time. And her time, the transitional decades between the 18th and 19th centuries, was an extremely complex and troubled period in the history of Great Britain. Austen's novels contain a number of references to the social, political and economic contexts of the present. But these references are very often implicit and sometimes ironic. Think of Northanger Abbey, where in chapter 14, Catherine Morland states, I have heard that something very shocking indeed will soon come out in London. And misunderstanding her, her friend Eleanor Tilney believes that she is referring not to a new and awfully shocking work of Gothic fiction, but to an actual revolutionary event such as the Gordon Riots of 1780, to which Eleanor's brother Henry alludes later in the chapter. Similarly, the context of the French Wars, concluded with the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, is crucial to persuasion, where Captain Wentworth's wealth comes from sharing the spoils of war. Or let us think of Pride and Prejudice, in which the militia are stationed in Meryton, which is the town closest to Longbourn, uh, the estate uh, where the Bennett family lives. A fact that brings the dangerous George Wickham in contact with the Bennett girls. Indeed, a crucial event underlying Austen's life and works was the French Revolution a fundamental context for understanding certain aspects of her writing from an ideological and political point of view. And in particular, the oscillations in her fiction between conservative positions on the one hand and liberal and reformist ideas on the other. On a family level, the revolution was felt directly by the Austen family circle when the Comte de Feuillide, the husband of their cousin Eliza and future wife of Jane's brother Henry Austen, was executed during the Jacobin Terror in Paris on the 22nd of February 1794. Now, the long wars with France had serious consequences for British society, such as the scarcity of goods and products, the increase in taxes, the difficulty or even the impossibility of visiting the continent, episodes of collective panic caused on several occasions by the threat of a French invasion, as well as the arrival of several waves of emigrants from France, mostly from uh, the aristocratic class, who settled in urban centres, often visibly transforming their demographic composition, for example in Winchester, the county town of Jane Austen's Hampshire. Another major development in these decades was the expansion of Britain's international power through commercial and territorial imperialism. After 1815, the United Kingdom and its ever-expanding empire became the first maritime power on the planet. The British Navy, so crucial in Austen's biography and output, ensured the country's control of the main communication and commercial routes of the globe and connections with colonies in America, Asia, Africa and Oceania. The Austens had a connection with British India through the figure of Saul Taiso, an administrator in the service of the East India Company and the husband of Reverend George Austen's sister. And in fiction, in Sense and Sensibility, for instance, we are told that Colonel Brandon spent part of his military career in the army of the East India Company. The terrible human cost of imperialism was not overlooked by Austen. The economy of the Caribbean territories, in particular, was based on the system of slavery. There, vast sugar plantations were tilled by slaves transported by British ships from Africa. In Austen's works, the issue of slavery, as well as the emergence of ideas promoting its abolition, appear in some references in Mansfield Park and Emma. In Mansfield Park, Fanny says, I love to hear my uncle talk of the West Indies. I could listen to him for an hour together, since her uncle, Sir Thomas Bertram, owns plantations there. And she tells her cousin Edmund, did you not hear me ask him about the slave trade last night? 
Unfortunately, her question in the episode is followed by total silence. The Bertrams do not take up the topic. Their silence is a devastating accusation on Austen's part. Now, the Bertrams in Mansfield Park also represent the central social group in Austen's fiction, the gentry. In Austen's time, society was not conceived of as divided into classes based on wealth. This concept emerged later uh, and spread later in Victorian times. Instead, uh, in the times of Jane Austen, society was divided into ranks. In Persuasion, the character of Mr. Eliot affirms rank is rank. And in this way, he makes clear an irrefutable truth. Society is based on distinctions of rank, intricate, imperceptible, and largely incomprehensible to us today. Rank was not defined on the basis of wealth and expenditure, but much more crucially on the basis of networks of contacts, uh, relations and acquaintances, levels of education, manners, and also linguistic competence. At the center of Austen's fictional universe is the rank, as I said, known as the gentry. And in her time, it was made up of the landed families of about 540 baronets, whose title was and still is hereditary, 350 knights, who could also use the title of sir and their wives that of lady, 6,000 landed squires and 20,000 gentlemen. This is the social group upon which Austen's novels centre. In contrast, and this is something that we tend to forget, there are very few characters from the middling ranks without any connections to land ownership. Very few aristocrats, for example, obviously, Lady Catherine de Bourgh in Pride and Prejudice, and even fewer members of the labouring population. Both the very rich Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy in Pride and Prejudice and the impoverished Miss and Mrs. Bates in Emma are gentry, precisely because wealth is not a decisive discriminating factor in this era. At the same time, however, the gentry is highly hierarchical and deeply rooted in the local area or neighbourhood pivoting round a large country house surrounded by an estate. This is a highly structured and ritualistic social context. And in Austen's novels, it all becomes clearly visible in the episodes of dancing. As a young woman, Austen herself loved to dance. And in Emma, she makes fun of young people's desire for dancing. She ironically observes that Instances have been known of young people passing many, many months successively without being at any ball of any description and no material injury accrue either to body or mind. However, she adds, nothing equals the pleasure afforded by the felicities of rapid motion. In her novels, however, dancing is mostly a narrative ellipse. She does not describe it in detail. Indeed, her readers did not require any description, as they could imagine exactly which dance characters would take part in, and all the contextual features of a ball. Precisely for this reason, though, because it is there but not there, dance and dancing are all the more significant in Austen's works. Uh, dance is relevant because of its wide-ranging socio-cultural symbolism and as the centre of episodes that usually function as major narrative turning points. In many ways, but not exclusively, I would say, dancing in Austen is emblematic of the courtship process and its outcome in marriage. Uh, let's consider, for instance, what the sententious Henry Tilney in Northanger Abbey declares. I consider a country dance as an emblem of marriage. Fidelity and complacence are the principal duties of both, and those men who do not choose to dance or marry themselves have no business with the partners or wives of their neighbours. It is an engagement between man and woman, formed for the advantage of each. It is their duty, each to endeavour to give the other 
no cause for wishing that he or she had bestowed themselves elsewhere. Therefore, dancing is yet another way for Austen to focus on the importance of stability and balance in society, particularly among the gentry, at a time of great socio-historical turmoil and dramatic transformations.